the myth as the core of that work. And um, Campbell, uh, Campbell's uh, work, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, that was mentioned in Kate's midweek uh, news piece, um, really uh, described the hero's journey, which, which Kate will, will be talking more about later. Campbell was a contemporary of Young, Carl Young, and um, as such, there are some very interesting uh, dynamics that you see between his work and Young's work. Myth in our age <clears throat> has been largely trivialized as meaning illusion, fabrication, even lies. Um, Sam Keen and, and Ann Valley Fox uh, in their book, Your Mythic Journey, which is a, a book that I have been uh, uh, working through, remind us that, the, that in the strict sense, myth refers to an intricate set of interlocking stories, rituals, rites, and customs that inform and give the pivotal sense of meaning and direction to a person, a family, community, or culture. So I would challenge us today that as we hear the story of Moses, I would ask very simply, what is your myth? Okay, let's see what uh, we've been doing over the past week. Ben, I think you have uh, the, the prelude, and we'll get started with that. Oh. 
took a long time to come Don't let go of my hand Now that darkness has gone And this will be our year Took a long time to come And I won't forget the way you held me up When I was down And I won't forget the way you said Darling, I love you You give me faith to go on Now we're there And we've only just begun Took a long time to come. Hey, thanks, Ben. <clears throat> we have uh, we have truly remarkable individual weekly journeys. Uh, for a call to worship today, I'll be reading from Psalms 105, um, verses 1 through 6, 23 through 26, and 45b. Alleluia, give thanks to Yahweh and call on God's name. Proclaim God's deeds among the peoples. Sing to God, sing praise and tell of all God's marvels. Glory in God's holy name. Let the hearts that seek Yahweh rejoice. Turn to Yahweh, to God's strength, and seek God's presence constantly. Remember the, car the marvels God has done the wonders performed and the judgments pronounced. Then Israel migrated to Egypt and settled in the land of Ham. Yahweh made the people fertile and more numerous than their oppressors, whose hearts were turned to detest God's people and to conspire against God's faithful. God sent Moses and Aaron, God's faithful chosen ones. Alleluia. Okay, uh, we're going to try this at home here. Um, I actually have a, I hope you can see it. My, uh, my setup here is not the greatest. I have a peace lamp. This peace lamp was actually made by Carl Barge and given to me uh, a number of years ago. And so um, we'll, we'll have the lighting of the peace lamp. Our tradition began many years ago uh, as a weekly symbol to stand against violence and war that was consuming the world at that time. Sadly, today we, we still light this peace lamp to dispel in just a, a small way the darkness and hate of war and violence throughout the world. <clears throat> so I'll try this. And I don't know if you can see the flame, but it is working. <laughs> Please join me in a, in a confessional prayer. Gracious and loving God, we acknowledge that as imperfect humans, we often fall short. You have taught us to trust you, but we prefer to trust ourselves. You have offered us peace, but we continue to live in chaos. You have offered us rest, but we are weighed down with our own sin. Help us to send, surrender our need for control, misguided self-sufficiency, and prideful arrogance. Forgive our sin. Heal our hearts. Cleanse our souls. Let us find true rest in you and strength for the journey. In Jesus' name, amen.
Gracious and loving God, you have blessed us beyond all measure with food, clothing, shelter, all of the things that we find safe and comfortable. We give back a portion of what you've given to us that your kingdom may be further in the world. In your name we pray, amen. Okay, our scripture today, uh, as we indicated earlier, um, our scripture will be from Exodus, uh, Exodus 3, verses 1 through 12. This is the story of Moses. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then God said, come no closer, remove the sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. God said further, I am the God of your father the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God said, I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. We'll now have children's time with Meredith. Good morning, University Mennonite children. Uh, I'm Meredith, and this is Alethea. She's going to be helping me with children's time this morning. The um, scripture this morning and what Kate's going to be talking about is the story of Moses, which is in Exodus in the Bible, and the story of Moses being called by God through a burning bush to do something he wasn't expecting to do. And Kate's going to be talking about journeys and how we all journey through life, and sometimes God calls us to unexpected things. And... Um, so I was thinking about, we all kind of sometimes have a plan for what we want to do, or we think we know how life is going to go, especially in school, we have certain expectations. And sometimes those expectations uh, turn out to be very different than what actually happens. And life kind of makes a turn that we're not expecting. And so I thought of Alethea when I was thinking of this. And so Alethea, do you want to tell us about your what happened? So in first grade, I was in Mrs. Ramey's class. And then um, I had, because of COVID, she had to switch to being the remote teacher. And I wanted to stay in person. So I had to switch to a different class. And then I found out that Miss Housel's class was actually really fun. And then in second grade, I, ha I had Mrs. Croswell. And then Miss Croswell got a new job tr as a translator for Spanish. And then I had to get Mrs. Rockwell. Do you remember when you were getting ready to go into first grade? What teacher did you really, really want? 
Miss Ramey. Mrs. Ramey. And how did you feel when you found out that Mrs. Ramey was going to be your teacher? Good. So excited. And how did you feel when you found out that you were going to have to switch out of Mrs. Ramey's class and go to a different teacher? Bad. Horrible. I cried. Yeah, it was hard, yeah. huh? Because you loved Mrs. Ramey and you had this idea that you knew how this year was going to go. You had this teacher you wanted and you knew who your class was. And then all of a sudden, it didn't go the way you thought it was going to go. And then you switched to Mrs. Miss Housel's class that was in first grade. And how was the first couple days in Miss Housel's class? It was good? Well, it wasn't as good as it eventually got, but I eventually um, really liked her. Was it a bit of a struggle at first to adjust? Yeah. To the change? It was also a struggle for me to not sit next to my friend and Evie because we had we weren't in the same position of desks. Oh, right, that too. Part of what Kate shared this past week in our midweek sharing was also looking at journeys and how sometimes we have this call to adventure and we leave what we think is going to happen. And then there's this what's kind of an initial period where there, it's hard, there's trials, we're adjusting, and then this return to kind of a feeling like okay we've figured this out we know where we're going again and it can be you feel like it's good again and that is something that we go through again and again in life and sometimes we find out on the other side of these trials it turns out it's really really good again uh, Miss Housel turned out to be a great teacher and do you remember at the end of first grade, then when you had to leave Miss Housel's class, what happened? I didn't want to leave Miss Housel. You didn't want to leave her. Um, so she turned out to be a really good match for you as a teacher. And I find it really great to think about that through all of those sorts of things, God is present with us. And God even sometimes calls us to make big changes like that. Now, I don't think God called you to switch classes. You didn't really have a choice in it. Um, but God was present there. And I think God helps us be brave and helps us adjust and helps us find joy in new things. And those are important things to remember when we set out on journeys or set out on a path that we think we know how it's going to go. And then all of a sudden... God or sometimes life is like, nope, we're going to go this way instead. Um, and now Mrs. Rockwell is a really good yeah, teacher. Yeah, it happened again in second grade too. Mrs. Croswell was really great and now Mrs. Rockwell's really great too. <laughs> and she pretends to be Cookie Monster. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining me. We're going to end in prayer. Can you pray with me? Dear God, thank you so much for being present with us through all sorts of different situations and journeys. And we're thankful that sometimes you call us to new adventures and you're present with us through the adjusting and the challenges, through the tears, and through the joy that we find um, when we come out the other side. Um, we ask you to be with each child this week, help them to journey throughout their days finding adventures, and finding new ways to love and bring joy to the world around them. Amen. Thanks, Meredith and Alethea. Alethea, I don't know if you're there, but what a gift to hear your story, like to hear how uh, that journey for you had some real struggles, but I'm um, grateful, grateful that you shared it with us. So thank you. As we move into our sermon time, as always, the, the service has been so rich so far. And so I invite you to just take a full breath. 
to settle into being right here together. Join me in prayer. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Well, as both Meredith mentioned and Doug, we are here in Exodus, and we're going to spend the next couple weeks in Exodus together. Last January, we spent several weeks looking at the first two chapters, the beginning of what be, would become this epic journey for the Israelite people. And now we're returning to that epicenter of Hebrew scriptures. And I want to look at Moses' journey, as Doug was explaining, through the lens of the hero's journey. And don't let that word hero trip you up, because the hero's journey is really all of our story. I want to share some slides with you. Because as Doug mentioned, back in the late 1940s, Joseph Campbell, who was a professor in comparative religion, he introduced this idea of the hero's journey, outlining a structure and showing that there are patterns, there are stages found in all of our stories from Greek myths all the way to really every religion in the world and in our everyday lives. The hero's journey isn't just for a chosen few, it's for all of us, for our children included. We are all on this journey in different times and places in our lives. In his book, the Hero with a Thousand Faces, Campbell describes how the hero's journey is part of the psychology of being human. It's my story, it's your story, it's the human story. It's found in the stories of the Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter and our superheroes like Spider-Man. No matter how small or inconsequential our lives may seem, each of us makes choices. And it's from the ordinariness of our lives that God invites us to something new. And it's not just about leaving home and venturing out on a quest. This journey may be very interior. It may be an interior journey where we meet the dark places within ourselves, where we hear God's invitation to expand our internal horizons. So before we dive and look into how this relates to Moses, I want to look at the outline of the hero's journey because there are three main stages, departure, initiation, and return. And within those stages, patterns and substages occur. From the call to the refusal of the call, at least for a time, and then, like Meredith said, back into the thick of the story, what often looks and feels like one step forward and two steps back. And yet the journey, our journey continues with a guide for Moses and the others with a guide through the waters into deserts that might seem to swallow us up and take decades to cross. The journey continues on and on with victories, with accomplishments, large and small, and plenty of trials and tribulations until we return, not once and for all, but eventually we come back transformed, broken, yet made anew. And like Meredith said, the journey is cyclical. It happens again and again. Some of these journeys arc across the span of our whole life, others in the course of a day. Over and over, we begin the process again, or we may choose to shut it down. It's a choice. One of the stages is the refusal of the call, which we'll look at again next week. Always a choice, whether we begin and set out or depart, or whether we stay small. But each stage comes with a cost. There's danger, there's loss. But also when we don't engage, when we don't enter the journey, 
there is the possibility of it showing up in our lives as a depression, as a fear, as lethargy. So there's a cost to engage, a cost to engage, but there's a cost to choose not to engage. Jesus showed us, showed us that this journey is a journey of life. And Jesus invites us to join him on it. So the wisdom, I believe, the wisdom, God's wisdom, is seeking and seeing the opportunities, the doors that might be open just to crack, inviting us to step in. Sometimes, sometimes the beginning happens by simply watching and looking and paying attention. So like Moses, like Moses out in the wilderness, beyond the wilderness, living his ordinary life, the hero's journey begins in the ordinary world. For Moses, it's there on an ordinary day in a place that's maybe is on the edge, but mostly still known that this revolution of Moses' story begins. The first call, the first step of the hero's journey is the call. When something unusual happens, often the hero doesn't know what to make of it. Whether it's you or me or Moses, we often don't know what to make of that beginning on that ordinary day. And so we're told in the midst of the ordinary that Moses is out beyond the wilderness. It's there, beyond the wilderness, carrying out the mundane work of caring for his father-in-law's flock that we find Moses. Beyond the wilderness. What might that spatial clue have to say to us? I wonder, is it a hint that Moses is seeking something in his life? Is he feeling an uneasiness or a readiness, an itch? of some sort? Was Moses ready to hear, to encounter God in this extraordinary way? And how about you? Can you identify times in your life when you've been uneasy or unsettled, restless? Maybe, maybe that's the beginning. For Moses, it began with the angel appearing out of a bush. And so here we are with Moses far, far out in the wilderness. Moses alone with his sheep. When something happens, we're told he looked. He looked and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Moses looked, he noticed, he saw this particular bush this ordinary and not so ordinary bush. He really looked at it, not a passing glance as he hurried down the path. He looked. How often are there hints of God, the fingerprints of God here in this place and we don't notice it. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. Moses looked and then he acted, not in a big way, but a significant way. We're told he turned aside. He stopped his usual patterns. He stepped off the beaten path, but he didn't step far. God saw to that. But Moses stopped and turned and took the first step. He moved toward the bush. Moses was curious, willing to turn aside, to step towards this new thing. All it took was a step, not even a step really. All it took was Moses' intention, his willingness to turn aside for God to act. We see a God here that is so willing to meet us, to encounter us, to be in relationship with us. Moses' curiosity and willingness are hidden 
are the hidden ingredient in this special sauce. It doesn't take much, but it makes a difference. This willingness to turn aside and see allowed for the encounter. Our scripture goes on. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called out of the bush, Moses, Moses. God calls him by name. God knows him. Moses. God desires to be in relationship with this outsider, the one born a Hebrew, raised in the palace of the Pharaoh, the one who fled all that he knew after committing murder, the one who finds himself in a foreign land working for his father-in-law, a priest of Midian. It's this man, Moses, a herder of sheep, an alien in a foreign land, one who doesn't quite belong anywhere, whom God calls by name. Moses, Moses, God is insistent. God is wanting Moses' attention. And Moses' response, here I am, here I am. Here, it reminds me of roll call in school when the teacher would call out my name. And in those first days of a new school year when everything was new, that first day or two, I'd listen especially carefully did the teacher say my name correctly? Did she know me? Did she call me Catherine or Kathy? Or did she call me by my name? Here, here I am. Those first days of school were the beginning of a relationship. The teacher calling out a name listening for the answer here, I'm present, ready to learn. And so here in our story today, the journey begins. Moses says, here I am. This flawed human with a complicated past, he says here. And God responds, come no closer, remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. God said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. I am the God of your father, of your people. God says, I know you, Moses. I know your name. I know your history. Moses, tending sheep, living his ordinary life, notices something strange and different. He's curious and steps off the path and suddenly finds himself standing on holy ground, hearing the voice of the God of his people. Moses took that first step, a step onto sacred ground, My friend, the hero's journey always begins. It always begins in the ordinary world. There is the summons, the call that often appears out of nowhere, like a burning bush. Our task, your task, my task is to look, to listen, to stop and engage and be curious. We're to wake up and take notice. It's holy ground that we're walking on. Maybe right here on the carpet with crumbs and frayed edges. Right here, the floor with dog hair and dust bunnies. Maybe we're standing on holy ground right now. And God is calling our name, inviting us to a journey with God. We don't know where this journey will take us. We don't know all the trials we'll face. But what do we know? We know that God is with us. 
God said, I will be with you to Moses. I will be with you. Jesus told his followers, I will be with you always. Jesus promised the coming of the spirit to dwell among us, to show us how to live. I think I love Moses because he was the most unlikely hero. How about you? In the ordinariness of your life, are there burning bushes in your midst? You don't need to look like a hero or feel like a hero. You simply need to notice and pay attention and be ready to turn, to take the next step, just the next step with the Holy One guiding you along the way. May it be so. Amen. Thanks to Becky Kephart for providing music this morning. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord, that song she just played says. Mighty, wondrous, loving, circled round with awe. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Well, as I mentioned, as I mentioned, tomorrow is MLK Day, a day where we um, celebrate Martin Luther King Jr.'s life, for he was one who really stepped out on the hero's journey. He was a man who was deeply flawed and yet one who followed Christ. And so I invite you to join me. Uh, he spoke after the signing of the Civil Rights Bill in 1964. He said, 
it was a great moment, something like the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation by Abraham Lincoln. And here we find ourselves more than 50 years later, waiting for his vision of justice for all to come to pass. So watch with me as we celebrate and remember this person who followed God as best he could. Uh, I, I did want to point out that those were powerful images that we saw in that film. And, um, you know, for, for many of us, uh, it's easy to slip into the idea that tomorrow is just another federal holiday and we won't get the mail. Um, but let's, um, let's try to, to uh, celebrate uh, um, MLK's life, particularly given um, the situation that we have in the U.S. now, which is a deeply divided country. Um, I'd like to continue our service now by introducing any visitors that are with us. We'd invite you to uh, uh, unmute and, um, and make yourself known to us. We would like to get to know you. Uh, if, if there are any visitors, please uh, let us know. Not seeing any visitors here myself. Oh, it's Kathy and Mark Shelley. We're back. Um, we've been with you a couple of years ago and we pop in and out. So we live in Danville. And so we are glad to join you today. Wonderful. Wonderful. Great to see you again. Are there others? Okay. Um, any announcements? Uh, and uh, we also include in that birthdays. Uh, that we would like to share for the uh, for the group. Silence. Okay. Alethi well, has if, a, a quick announcement here. Yeah. Um, my school is doing jump rope for heart. So, um, please donate. My dad will send a link out later with details. I think that also applies to Cedric and Amy. Jonas, kindergartners don't do jump rope for heart quite yet, but for, no. for three of them. 
Thanks, Alethea. Let's uh, let's support our kids. Are there others? Any birthdays? One um, lesser known um, celebration tomorrow on MLK Day is uh, the 35th wedding anniversary of Betsy and I. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Wonderful. Very good. Maybe a bit snowy and icy tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Well, if there are no further announcements, please join me in a benediction. I've actually managed to keep the flame going without burning my house down. Um, if you would um, uh, join me in the benediction. Go into your weekly journey, serving your Savior with love, delighting in the life that God has given you. God be with us until we meet again. Amen.